Good morning. Uh, my name is Martin Risley, and um, I'm here to talk about Paganini. What was he thinking? That's <laughs> the title of today's um, talk. Well, before we talk about what was he thinking, let's talk a little bit about um, the works themselves and um, a little bit, of back, little bit of background. Is it not on yet? Hello? Yes, here I am. Good morning. My name is Martin Risley. I'm here to talk about Paganini. What was he thinking? Um, the Caprices, his opus one, of Niccolò Paganini were the works with which he introduced himself as a composer. Just like Beethoven, his, he wrote a lot of pieces, but his opus one, that was you know, the way he wanted to be published and introduced to the world, well, that's what Paganini did. So he wrote them around 1805 and the years around that time, which was only three years, can you believe it, after the first publication of Bach, Bach's Six Sonatas and Partitas for Solo Violin. So, those were unknown works relatively at that time. And the actual manuscript of the Bach wasn't discovered until quite a few years later when it almost got sent into the rubbish bin. So it's a mir miraculous story of that. But um, these caprices and those solo works of Bach remain to this day the two dual pinnacles of the solo violin repertoire. And that's why selections from those, both of those works are included in every violin competition the world over. Um, <clears throat> he was born in 1782 in Genoa, so he was about 23 when he was, when he was working on these caprices. And he'd studied, interestingly enough, with a, a chap called Alessandro Rolla, who you probably never heard of, but um, we're starting to perform some of his viola works. He wrote a lot of virtuoso concertos for viola, and when you listen to it, you think, oh, that sounds a bit like Paganini. <laughs> So he, he was sort of the, um, the viola Paganini in, uh, before, before Paganini's time. So that there were a lot of Italian composers around that time working with string instruments. And as of course you know about the, the great Italian uh, history of violin making. And so that the, the synergy there is, is very, very strong and, <coughs> and very important, especially in the 19th century. These caprices were dedicated to Ali Artisti. So he didn't say to anyone specifically, but they were immediately judged to be unplayable. He didn't intend them to, for public performance, although the 24th one, which is the one that pretty much everybody knows because there have been so many versions of it that have gone through the centuries, and we'll talk about those later on, because somebody's playing that today, which is fantastic, and somebody played it yesterday. Um, other than that one, um, they, they were not intended for public performance, but the 24th Caprice, he wrote a guitar accompaniment for it, so no doubt he, he would go around and play it with guitar. But a lot of these sort of pieces, he probably didn't feel that they would be able to be just played on their own without an accompaniment, much, much like in Bach's day, as I was talking yesterday, that, that music often need, needed a bass, bass accompanying, accompaniment, and it was very strange that these, these were written without and specifically saying without basic accompaniment. But they are, they're not a collection of studies, as, as we sort of think that they may be. The extensions of the violin technique and the, the way the musical narrative can be applied to a violinist that, that has uh, propelled these pieces into, into the realm beyond just mere, um, a mere expressions of, of studies and ways of playing. Just in many ways, I think of these caprices as his thesis about, about what he thinks the violin is capable of, his possibilities. And, and why that's important is because nobody had, he basically took the violin from where it was here and propelled it up there. There wasn't a kind of a gradual, <laughs> a gradual evolution. And it's the same with Bach. And that's probably why these are the two pinnacles. Bach suddenly wrote these absolutely amazing works that were this far above anything else that had ever been done before. And it's the same with Paganini in terms of the possibilities of the violin. How, is this, how could it be done? But he proved he could do it because he performed it and played it like that. So it wasn't just a composer sitting down writing things that were impossible to do. His concerti, though, by contrast, are much closer to the Italian opera of the day. And if you listen to them, they sound very similar to Rossini and, and uh, other Bellini and composers, uh, they, early Rossini, I would say, 
the violin is often used as a coloratura voice, and they'll take a string, he'll take a D string, and he'll make that a tenor voice. And then he'll switch to the E string, and it'll be a soprano singing on the E string, and then he'll go over to the G string. And it's very, very operatic. And so you do hear some of that in the caprices as well, using the use of string with characters and narrative. But the, the, in the caprices, the violin has to take on all the roles, so many, many roles, not just the coloratura singing voice. I would say that, that in terms of his composition, this is closer to the real Paganini that he wanted to write, as opposed to the opera, which was very popular at the time, which he wrote because it would make him money. <laughs> because opera was popular, that's why a lot of what he published was, was operatically inspired. It was variations on opera. A lot of the pieces that he wrote variations on, you wouldn't even know them today. The operas Tancredi and, and uh, Moses in Egypt, and op operas that were popular in his time, but have not really stayed, <coughs> stayed greatly popular now. <laughs> so, so it's an interesting sort of look at, you think today of pop artists and doing things for the, pub, for the public and then doing things for themselves. You can, even if Andrew Lloyd Webber, you could say, because he did something with Paganini, he writes the things that make him money in the, in the theater, but he also does the other things like requiems, and he wrote a piece of variations for his brother. So you can often see in these composers that, that are very high in the public um, in the public eye that uh, they're not always doing things that, that they might want to do. And, and you have to look further to see the things that they that they're really may be more inside, more um, personal to them. So the Caprice has fallen into that category. He, he published them as his Opus I and and didn't really perform them as such, except for the 24th, we're pretty sure he did that. And the, one, the originality of their conception, there are so many different, different ideas throughout, from number one through to number 24, there's so many ways that the violin is treated, that that is what has enabled them to stand to this day as a sort of touchstone of performance art, one that has inspired countless other musicians, from Liszt to Schumann, and Chopin. In fact, Liszt, who was one of the greatest figures of transforming um, in the 19th century into Romanticism, he was inspired initially by what he saw with Paganini. And he basically was like, I'm going to do that on the piano. <laughs> and he modeled his, his career and was fabulously successful in, in that way as a performance artist as well. Brahms even devoted a whole set of variations for solo piano on this 24th Caprice that we'll hear today. And Rachmaninoff used the theme for his Rhapsody, Andrew Lloyd Webber, as I mentioned. So the many characters and, and roles that the violinist is called to play are something that we'll be looking for in these performances as well. How can the player bring out a flute or a, or a horn or, a, or a, a male singer or a soprano singer or, or the different things that might be embedded within the music? But the crazy innovations that Paganini did didn't come absolutely out of nothing. Right? He did raise things very, very suddenly, but they did come out of the Italian violin tradition of Tartini, Locatelli, Vivaldi, and Corelli. And of those people, Locatelli was the most insane <laughs> of his writing. He, he, almost, he tried to experiment with thumb position, for example, on the violin, which is, it works on the cello quite well because of the cello sitting either on your knees in the old days or now on the floor, so you can lift your thumb out and play went down, but doing that on the violin, when most of us hold the violin in the hand and up, that means that everything has to be held here, and when you're pushing down with your thumb, it's, it doesn't create a great sound. So that, that experiment that Locatelli did was a failure, <laughs> but Paganini's hands were so flexible, like we think he had a rare uh, disease of the bones that enabled him to... to stretch his fingers an enormous degree, which may have helped him quite a lot. Um, so he didn't use his thumb. He, he was able to, to stretch very, very far around the instrument. Tartini is probably the man who, who started this whole idea of the violin and the devil being together, <laughs> because he wrote this devil's trill that you've probably all heard of. Somebody was asking me yesterday about how difficult that was. And he dreamt it. He, in a dream, he dreamt that the devil was doing this trill, and then he wrote it into a piece of music, this very famous sonata now. 
And the old idea of a trill, too, it has a devilish quality to it, this and this uh, demonic aspect. And we heard yesterday the tenth caprice of Paganini, which for me is one of the most demonic, because it's full of these trills, trills everywhere. Um, and, it's, and the caprice, uh, no, not the tenth, is full of the staccatos, as well as this trill ideas it, it, that come along to the end. So the staccatos, is a, a lot of notes coming in this flying up bow, as well as these trills on these downbeats, and that creates this very devilish um, aspect. Um, as we know, Paganini picked up on that, that idea of the devil with the violin and used it as a marketing tool. <laughs> and uh, people used to often say that he must have sold his soul to the devil and um, that became part of his persona, and he would um, be very insouciant. If you can see from the pictures on the stage, it was just all looking very, very relaxed and calm for the ladies. He was not very uh, stressed out. He probably wasn't very, uh, that kind of energy. He was very, very cool and calm, and insouciant is the word I would, I would use to describe how he probably would be, would be playing. and. It was, Wizardry. Lister was supposedly um, <laughs> very devilish looking on the piano as well. But uh, to, we all know the story that he made up that he probably went to jail and learned how to play the violin in jail and then sold his soul to the devil and came out of jail playing the violin very, very well. Um, but Pope Leo XII gave him a golden spur, which is for services to the Catholic Church. And he gave him to the Paganini in 1827. So perhaps the, <laughs> the legend that we hear about the demonic aspect is, is in proportion quite overplayed to how he actually was in his, in his time perceived amongst his peers. But Paganini synthesized all of that work of the people in Italy before him, the Tartini, Locatelli, Vivaldi, and Corelli, and he, he turned all of that into this crazy devilish wizardry that then inspired Liszt, who wanted to do on the piano the same things that he had done on the violin. Of course, Liszt went on to alter the course of musical history, which means that really Paganini inspiring Liszt was incredibly important in musical hist historical terms, <coughs> even though he's not one of the great composers, but he, his time in history, and he was es essentially the first rock star, <laughs> the, the, the first person who took his personality on stage and he just played his own music. He played some other people's music as well, but it was all about what he was able to do on the violin. And it's interesting that he used the devil as, as that marketing tool, because how many rock stars do we know that identify with angelic <laughs> presences as, as opposed to ones that will say that they've got something to do with the devilish aspect? Um, there's a few of those who've used that as well in, in the modern age. So. He pretty much invented all of that stuff. <laughs> and he's still got the Order of the Golden Spirit from the Pope, so I wonder if the death metal rockers can do that as well, and they're beyond, they're beyond, beyond something. Okay. Um, also Berlioz as well. Berlioz, he wrote um, the great Herald in Italy for, for Paganini, which was written for him to play on the viola, but Paganini found it not difficult enough and refused to play it. But they were great friends, and Paganini used to send him money when Berlioz was younger to help him become a composer. But in terms of, of the Herald in Italy, he was like, not difficult enough. Can you make it more difficult? And Berlioz said, no. <laughs> this is my piece. This is what it is. And, and it remains a great, a great work for violists to play, but it's not a show, a show showpiece for the viola, and you can see that. And the viola is part of, a part of, that, of that work. And it's, and it's um, Berlioz, of course, wrote the Symphonie Fantastique, which you think is written about the time of Beethoven was still alive, 1828. It's an astonishing um, work. And again, that, devil, that devilry comes out in that, right? The last movement of the Symphonie Fantastique is the witch's dance. <laughs> and there was a whole thing going on at the time of, um, of devilish wizardry, and he, he did it with the whole orchestra. So Paganini had a lot to do with that kind of spirit and energy, um, exciting people, and his concerts were, concerts were legendary. And he'd go around and everybody would want to come and, and hear, his, hear his concerts. And unfortunately, all of that traveling he did took a great toll on his health, and um, 
one thing after another, and it got to such a stage that he would just be cancelling concerts because he was always sick with one thing or another. And that's when he, after he quit performing, that's when he began publishing, and making sure that all of his compositions that he wanted to remain um, were written down. And there's a bunch of them that he didn't publish that we've still got, and quite a few more that we don't have. And a lot of the violin concertos, for instance, we don't even have the violin part. <laughs> we have the orchestra parts that were preserved from when he played them with orchestra. We have all, the, all their parts, but he didn't write down his solo part. So some people have been figuring out um, over <laughs> hundreds of years, doing, filling the blanks and finding out what the solo part may have been. But with those works, there's always a, you know, quite a bit of doubt. But the ones that he published that have opus numbers, th those are the ones he took great care in, and the opus number one being the caprices. So even though he wrote them back in 1805, by the time they came to be published, he'd, he'd had a bit of time to think about them and, and make them exactly as he wanted them wanted them to be. What's really astonishing about them is how innovative they are. If you, if you, if you, take, if you take the position of somebody in, in the 18, early 1800s, and you, you do have the innovations of Beethoven happening at that time, but the, in the Italian tradition, it's, it's much rougher and, and crazy, crazy things are going on with, uh, with both the, the performance techniques that are just all over the place. The cicadas that we heard yesterday, and and um, these bouncing bow bow things that are all this all this kind of strange articulations. But it must have seemed outlandish and wild, much as we were talking about some of these the pop stars of today that are trying to shock people. It must have been very shocking, and and different for the time uh, what he was doing. So although he modelled them on Locatelli's 24 caprices which were written in 1733, quite a long time before 1805. And th those were incorporated rather eccentrically into his Art of the Violin Concertos. He wrote a bunch of concertos and then stuck these caprices in the middle of them. He was a very odd fellow, Locatelli. But, but we don't remember those pieces, we don't play those same pieces in the same way that um, Paganini has, has captured the attention and, and held popularity for 200 years. But it's not just the caprices that have, he's been remembered for, it's also the pieces like the Motor Perpetuo that you've, m many of you may have heard before that goes on and on and on in a, in a group of notes that don't repeat for about five minutes. There's about 5,000 notes in that piece. <laughs> they go by and a lot of instruments have, have made their own versions of it. I've heard Wynton Marcellus even recorded it on the trumpet, can you believe it? Because he could do um, the circular breathing in and out, so he could keep going for five minutes, playing. <laughs> Amazing, right? So Paganini's inspiration has continues into the into the 20th century and, and beyond in, in other instruments. Cantabile is another beautiful piece that he wrote that is still being popular. <clears throat> but the caprices are the most daring ones that he wrote both in the scope of his ideas of what to do with the violin and in his harmonic idiom. The Oxford Dictionary of Music defines a capriccio as according to the fancy or the caprice of the performer, hence a composition which is unexpected and original effects. This pretty much fits the description really well of what these are. So it's up to the performer, and you've seen eight of them already doing doing things with these caprices, amazing things, yes, technically amazing, but also trying to, to show us other, other characters of the violin that, that you don't hear in, 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 in other, other pieces written for the instrument. <coughs> and it cautions also, that, that definition cautions, cautions us against the sometimes rigid and mechanical performance that can lead to predictab predictability in this kind of thing. And there's not really any way to go on stage and play these caprices predictably. It's, they're, they're aptly named. They're full of danger. <laughs> they're extremely difficult to pull off. So when you come into a competition situation and you're going to play one of these caprices, you, you just take it in your hand, you take a breath, and, <laughs> and you just go for it. But from, from these pieces, a few conclusions can be drawn, perhaps, about Paganini's own playing. We can't travel back in time and listen to him. As we know from Stephen Hawking, if we could do that, then people would have come back to us already and talked to us from the future. So it's not going to happen. But what we do maybe surmise is his intonation must have been impeccable. The double-stopped the double harmonics that he wrote 
um, all over the place, and not, not so much in the caprices, but in some of his other operatic variation works, one has to be absolutely in tune. There's, there's less than a tenth of a millimeter of error, room for error with, with any of the fingers to be in tune for those. They don't speak unless you play incredibly accurately. So that, that's one reason that he, it would have just sounded awful if, if, he, if he played out of tune. So he must have had incredible accuracy of pitch. And <clears throat> when he died, he owned at least 11 Stradivari violins. Not bad, <laughs> considering how much they're worth today. Um, plus the Del Jesu, which is probably the greatest Guarneri Del Jesu, although we don't hear it very much, but people have started to be able to play it. It's, it's enshrined in Genoa. And it's nicknamed the Canon for its big sound. He probably needed a big sound because the way he played uh, was more about um, the astonishing uh, way of getting around the instrument rather than for projecting a big sound. You can tell from looking at the way he held the violin that he, there was no way that he would be a huge sound player. That came later. The people with the big sound, people like Vinyavsky. Vinyavsky is probably his next real predecessor after Paganini, the Polish violinist. He was the he was the, probably the next important composer virtuoso of the violin in the 19th century, and he played with great facility too, but also pioneered that, that huge modern sound as he was getting, the, the modern bow had been, been invented by then, but in Paganini's time it was still transitional. The bow as well was not what we have today, and um, didn't produce as big a sound, but it was very good for bouncing around and doing some of his crazy, crazy, um, Techniques, but also what you think about it in terms of Liszt with the piano, his pianos may not have been the same as what we have today as well. Poor pianists today working with these very heavy modern instruments, the action on these keys is, is a lot heavier than perhaps, especially when Mendelssohn, what Mendelssohn had, and Mendelssohn write, writing a piano like this, about all over the place. But the modern players can do that on these pianos, which Mendelssohn probably never, never thought would be possible. It's the same thing a little bit with the violins as well. Um, back in Bach's day, the, the Baroque violin could play very, very quickly, and still can, if you pick up a Baroque violin. So some of the tempos that he marked, for instance, in, in, um, in the fourth Brandenburg concerto for the violin, solo violin part, are incredibly difficult on a modern violin to make speak, because the instrument is so tight compared to a Baroque violin. So it's a very similar thing on the piano. So all of those historical changes that have happened the performers have to overcome those and play on their modern instruments and, and still do what the composer intended. So it's, it's all very, very challenging. And yet, so many people are doing it. <laughs> um, when I was young, very few people had, had recorded the caprices, but now it seems uh, one, one person after another is, is playing them all and, and doing, doing incredible things with them. So, this is what happens in, in human history. You put an obstacle in front of people and they're like, okay, I'll figure, <laughs> figure out how to get around it. They, I, they're incredibly important. An essential element of the performance of these pieces is the inherent danger and the risk in the ex execution. Yeah, and that's why the performance of them is so much more exciting than, than just listening to them on a recording. But it's the problems that they present to every player, and every player's different size of hands. As I mentioned, Paganini's hands were so flexible, he could do incredible things. But I've seen players with smaller hands than mine stretch further than I can just because of their flexibility and their, their skill. And um, so every player needs to solve these problems of execution, and it's integral to their own development to learn these pieces as well, whether they perform them or not. And to get to this level to perform them in a competition, I mean, all of the performers you hear can do this, <laughs> and very, very well. A couple of the, the, the other techniques we'll hear today, we're going to hear number 24, as I mentioned. I'll have to stop in a minute. But the staccato that we saw yesterday in number 10, you're gonna, number 7 is full of staccatos. I would call it, rename it the staccato. And the whole piece has got down, down and up. And staccato is a kind of stopping of the bow in the middle of the stroke. And it looks very impressive. And the reason it's important in a thing like a competition or, or assessing playing is because the, the fine control that the player has over every little millimeter of the bow in order to make it sound in that way is what, what they'll be looking for and hearing and, and, 
and that's just one of the things that, that we'll be hearing today. So look for the staccatos, the ricochets, which is the throwing of the bow. We might hear that in number five. There's two number fives today. We might hear that the, the throwing of the bow in there, as well as the number one, which is the Prelidia Caprice. But um, there's lots of exciting things to happen today and I follow up with Paganini, so I hope you enjoy them as much as I will. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop.